Quick and painless. Whenever they build something, they always ensure that they 
have their schematics as well as the Gerber files available so that everyone can modify. Okay, they fold uh, like Lady Ada who actually runs it, basically has built a whole company around that. Okay, so there you can see a bunch of on the right, okay, which are kind of dark in color. The circular one that's called the circuit Python. I mean, it's called. Okay, the, what is it? New Age. No, no, it's a, it's Neopix set, but it, uh, I think it's called Circuit Playground. I think that's the name of the board. Okay, so that one I've used that one. So what you can do with that, you can obviously program in C, but you can also program in something called a circuit python. Okay, so you can flash the circuit python bootloader in it. And if you know of Python, so you can directly adapt to this. So mostly this is something like the kids normally at ages from say age standard above can easily play around with this. And they know Python. And I think a slightly more involved board is the next one. I've mentioned that board because there's another famous I won't say it's a movement, but there was a whole community around these chips called ESP8266, these cheap Wi-Fi boards. Okay, and a bunch of these cheap Wi-Fi boards are now in most of your so-called smart bulbs or your smart sockets. So finally, behind the scenes, if you open one of them, you see one of these cheap ESP8266 Wi-Fi boards. Okay, so this is slightly more involved. Again, you program in C, and there is also Python uh, library around that. Okay, so Adafruit has built one of their boards, they call it the Feather board. I think it's Feather ESP 8266 or something like that. So more Node Yeah, there's, uh, it's called, there's another board by Node MCU as well. So yeah, that's the board, but that I'm not sure is open source hardware. It comes from China, so I mean there's a thing to it, right? So I didn't put it up here on the slide. But I've used a bunch of Node MCU just because, yes, they are changing. So, the next one is another Arduino board. Uh, Arduino, when they started, they didn't have any connectivity as such. Okay, slowly they started adding connectivity. And uh, to, my, to my luck or bad luck, I mean, I passed out engineering in 2005. Okay, so that was when actually Arduino started. So I missed that whole thing with respect to uh, using an Arduino during my engineering days. But then, as soon as I heard about this, I got into Arduino. and. First, when they started, we had to put those Zigbee modules and stuff like that to connect between the two Arduinos. Okay, but now if you go today, they have a USB-C connector on it. Okay, which is nothing like it, and you have various kinds of protocols supported from Bluetooth to BLE to Wi-Fi. Okay, and then you have LoRa boards as well. Okay, the next thing is I just put the ones down there. Those are another two. Beagle phones, there was one small project that they did where they came out with something called a pocket beagle. Okay, so this was to kind of uh, make the board small as possible with the same Citara chip so that it could be embedded into various other devices. Okay, and I'll come to a slide which talks about where all it's being used. So here is an example wherein you can directly have your old games, like anyone's, I know most of you are young, but people remember playing uh, arcade games like Super Mario and uh, Contra and all those NES games, right? So you could basically put uh, all those NES games, uh, it's a gray area, legal or illegal, I mean you can debate all that stuff. But yes, you could have that and then you could put it on there and you could play those games on the screen. Okay, so if you're kind of nostalgic like that, so I mean you could obviously go into something like that. Okay, these are just a few boards that I have used. Okay, there are a bunch of other boards. One thing to remember is uh, there are a lot of boards that come out from China and some other places, right? And they slap that Kia open source, famous Kia open source logo on it. But it's not potentially open source, okay? So that's something to keep an eye out for. So when you're buying something, if you want to support a company that is really making open source hardware, look for that logo, but do your own research behind the scenes. Yeah. Okay, so all these boards now I further classified with the emerging technologies that are up for debate today as well as being actively used. Okay, so one of them is in the IoT world. Okay, so there's a bunch of folks, it has become so cheap that you don't need to be in a company to actually do something related to IoT. You can get one of these Arduino boards or you could get one of those feather boards and they've taken it to the next level where you don't need to learn to solder now. So one thing that used to keep a lot of people away from electronics was you have to start the soldering iron and you get burnt and this and that. So all that stuff is gone out of the window. There is something called a few companies like Seed Studio have come up with these automatic attachable connectors. Okay. 
So you could directly attach all those sensors that you see down on the right, which is like a temperature sensor, a buzzer, a button, and also a screen, a small screen, connected directly to a board. So you don't need to even solder. Okay, and then you can write programs in Python or whatever programming language you like on that board. So one thing I forgot to mention is BeagleBone actually supports uh, Linux operating systems, right? So you can, like Raspberry Pi on the BeagleBone, you can have a Linux operating system. They have, when they first come out, they come up with something called as Anstrom. Okay, but you can obviously flash uh, any Debian-based operating system like Ubuntu or pure Debian also on it. Okay. So here are a few examples, like various technologies. The first one is the ESP32, I think. So ESP. 86 is older brother, okay, uh, not in age but in terms of power, okay, so it's ESP32, then you have like another board that has cellular on it, then the board just below that has Bluetooth LE, okay, so those are the various boards, similarly Arduino, uh, when the vehicle board again first came out, it did have Wi-Fi and all this capability as I was mentioning, but since it is open source hardware, Seed Studio actually beat them to the punch and added Wi-Fi and uh, uh, what do you call it, DLE and all these other protocols to it. Okay, so that is one thing. So this is an advantage of open source. So maybe your team is currently working on something else, but someone else is out there, they can directly build off it, right? That was a big advantage. And then they built their whole ecosystem around that. All the sensors. Next big topic spoken about it mostly robotics. Uh, so with respect to robotics, there's a bunch of open source uh, hardware boards. You have the BeagleBone Blue. Okay, so if anyone's into uh, rovers or anything, you could use something like the BeagleBone to Again, it runs Debian, Ubuntu and stuff like this. Unlike the Raspberry Pi, with BeagleBone, the biggest advantage is you get something called as the Cloud9 ID. So you don't need to connect a monitor and all that stuff get started with programming and stuff like that. You can go and you just connect your USB in. If your operating system detects a USB host, I think in Windows, I'm not sure you may have to install a driver or what have you, I'm not right. But in Linux and on a Mac, you directly connect in. Something called as Cloud9 ID pops in. You just enter a URL, okay? And on that Cloud9 ID, you can write programs both in Python, C, and I think so it also supports Node.js, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So that is one thing, BeagleBone Blue. What you see on the top right over here, that is another Adafruit product which is basically giving you, uh, I think it's 16 channels. You can connect 16 servos or 4 steppers as well as motors to it if you want to make a robotics project. Okay, similarly here. That was, uh, down there was my attempt at building a quadcopter which was, which took a lot of pain because when the story is, around building this, I didn't know anything about aerodynamics. Okay, so what I thought is, I'll look at how a quadcopter looks. Design 3D, design one of them. 3D print one of them and see if it flies. Okay, that's a very bad approach. Actually, as someone was speaking just earlier without reading the documentation, if you start programming all those problems that you run in, that is what I ran in over there. Okay, but it was a good learning experience as such. Okay. Still, would I say that I know some aerodynamics? I had to learn it because I teach a course at uh, is a course at ITI Kapura called Drone Technician. So since I am teaching that course, I have to learn aerodynamics forcefully. Did I enjoy learning it? Obviously no. But yes, that is how that came about. I'll show you the video towards the end if we have time. Okay. So yeah, robotics. The board that you could use over there for big robotics projects is for even a board copter, you could use the Beagle Bone Blue. Okay, there are other boards like Pixhawk which run Arduino Pilot and stuff like that. So if you're an engineering project or computer science guys, they normally use those Pixhawk boards. That is not open source. Uh, but yes, you can use a BeagleBone and do your end-to-end -end project using Arduino Pilot itself. That's the same software. Okay. Next, AJI. This is something that I've been wanting to get in. Uh, I know there was a bunch of folks who spoke about uh, AI. Uh, so the whole idea here is, what I've tried is that I tried that Pi batch that you see over there, as well as uh, the AGI, but what my limitation was, I didn't know how to train and do all that, basically no time to get to all that, but what I was able to do is run a few examples, that is run TensorFlow Lite on both these boards. Okay, so if you want to 
explore AI, especially AGI, then these are your boards to go for. And if you're a strong Linux user, then yes. I mean, there is something called as the BeagleBone AI, which is the white board on the left there, which is worth a buy. I think it's about 6,000, but it runs Linux, and you get a bunch of experiences with respect to AGI running there. If you want to screen, do some screen stuff, then yes, you can try the Pi Batch. Uh, there is also an Arduino based thing, which is bottom near the trees over there. Unfortunately, he was never able to try that board because that board is currently stuck at Bombay Customs. I'm not sure when they would have seen it. So that's what that is. Okay, so next, going really quickly, is prototyping, right? So when you sp speak about prototyping, first thing that comes to people's mind is yes, a 3D printer these days, right? So before this, so 3D printing, why was it not famous maybe when I was an engineer? Why was it not famous in 2005? It was not famous because it was stuck behind a patent, which was held by 3D systems. That patent kind of expired around, I would like to say, I may have the years wrong over here, around 2013-14, around that time. Once that patent expired, a bunch of companies started developing 3D printing. There was a RepRap project that started, very similar to how the GNU project started. Based on those fundamentals, they started this whole RepRap project and they started building 3D printers which could self-replicate. So from one 3D printer, you can make another 3D printer by making parts for it. Okay, so that is what they kind of uh, did. Here was one uh, 3D printer that I was trying out uh, soon after two years that they, I mean 3D printing started became an active thing somewhere around 2013-14 was that 3D printer down there. Okay, so what I was trying to do over there is using the beagle bone, I wanted to control the 3D printer. Okay, so there was this software that was at a very nascent stage called OctoPrint, which basically allows you to control 3D printers. Now the fancy 3D printers that come, you don't need to do all this. They all come with a fancy screen, so you type in buttons, click, and everything prints out. Okay, so much so that you can actually design and click a button on your screen now via Wi-Fi and transfer to your 3D printer, the printer will uh, print. But these were like self-assembled ones, okay? so that was a self-assembled one. So the idea there was you could monitor the 3D printer from somewhere else because it didn't have a screen. Otherwise, you have to have your laptop connected which is running that software. And the problem was if your laptop goes to sleep, your 3D printer also stops. Okay, so all those issues were kind of solved by the BeagleBone and this another open source software which is called OctoPrint that was being developed. So that was an early view into that particular software. Okay, so the best part about 3D printing, right, and how, why is, why am I bringing 3D printing into this whole open source kind of thing? The best part is, there is a site called Thingiverse, wherein you can post your models, okay, and based on your models, either based on the license that you give the model, obviously when I publish stuff, I put it under Creative Commons 3.0, okay, well, okay, so what happens there is you could basically either use someone else's model, right, and build on that, or you can have your own model that you publish in a bunch of folks to build on that. So this was one of the early models that I had done somewhere in 2014, where there was a smartwatch. Anyone heard of the Pebble smartwatch? The one with the e-ink display, right? So what had happened was I had lost my charger for the Pebble smartwatch. I could have gone to one of the big shows and bought a charger or waited for days, or I could have 3D printed a charger off so someone had already designed another charger for another smartwatch. Okay, so you, by looking at that concept, I said, oh, I could also try something. And after six or about eight tries, I was able to create my own charger by 3D printing. And those two things that are going there, if you know the basic USB, it has two wires plus a DXRX. Those were just the power connectors that I gave there at the back of the charger. So that is something that you can achieve with 3D printing today. Something small breaks in the house, you can fix it directly instead of waiting for the part. But I'm guessing that's not a big problem with Amazon shipping it. Okay. So, finally I wanted to mention Raspberry Pi. Okay, having said that, Raspberry Pi is not open source hardware. Okay. It is, runs a bunch of open source software. Right, so that's, that's why I've added it here. So, what he mentioned. The big thing about Raspberry Pi is it's got a huge community around it. I know Mr. Kamath also referenced this quite a bit. So that 
is one of the big things running for it. Arduino and Raspberry Pi, since it has a huge community, so if you make a mistake, you can get help. Having said that, within Goa, an observation of mine has been, even at engineering colleges, we still use Raspberry Pi. Okay, which I would say is a bad thing as such, but I think so we need to move on to something more equivalent in terms of a beagle bone or what have you, so that folks have an ability to modify the schematic finally and come out with something new. Right? So that should be something, but yes, from a lower grade standpoint, it's a great move that we are trying to go towards the Raspberry Pi and teach people Linux within Goa. So, okay, why open, why open hardware? Just a few points. One thing, before when COVID hit, everyone wanted to make COVID face shields. Obviously, you could take and bend a wire and make a nice, uh, make a face shield. But using 3D printing, you could have made a much fancier one, which you could have actually worn and gone to office. Right? So a bunch of folks actually in COVID, the first thing that they thought of is making face shields and those lovely masks kind of uh, protectors or what have you. Another big thing is the prosthetics companies, if you think that's a huge, a lot of people call it a money making racket, but it's there. With respect to if you want something customized, it will cost you like a huge delta. But with 3D printing, you could actually uh, kind of reduce that. Another thing is, if you have heard about this Volkswagen emission gate, right? This was one thing that happened a few years ago wherein uh, the Volkswagen catalytic converters were not up to the mark, right? And that actually was behind the scenes. It was caught by a few Adafruit sensors and an open source hardware board. And that's how they were identified and caught at the end of the day. It was not that some European, big European agency went and caught them specifically. It was just caught by a few hackers who published it and then the European agencies, I think, took action based on that. Okay, with respect to the Beagle Bone, yes, it's where all this is, is since it's open hardware, it's a well-tested platform, right? So it's in a bunch of places. There in satellite networks, into thermal laser cutters, and a bunch of other places. So if you want to kind of develop something new, you could obviously do it. Okay, just added that point, and that's the most meaningful point, I think. So when you go to buy something out in the market, right, you never see how many patents that thing has. So when you buy an Apple iPhone, you don't say, oh, shit, this has 16 patents. This would be better than buying an Android phone that has just four patents. Right? What you as a user are looking for is what value that thing is bringing to you. Right? So the whole point about open source hardware is, yes, you can be a profitable business. And as someone said earlier, uh, it's free, but it's not free as in free beer. Right? So you can obviously charge it as a service over time. Again, like open source software, the biggest advantage in hardware is you get community feedback real fast. Okay, so iterating on something will be will be fast. Like you, it's not like your old page sitting on the side there. Okay, and no one's kind of changed it. Right, so it's okay, I know most of y'all over here are from the computer background. Okay, so y'all would ask me, hey man, I'm into software. Why do I learn hardware? Right. So the only reason you would learn hardware is to pick up a few skills, which could be handy for you. Maybe at home, or maybe if someone asks you, right, put on your resume or what have you. So, as I mentioned, soldering, you actually don't need soldering to get, up, get started with anything embedded anymore. Okay, but yeah, soldering is a skill that is worthwhile having. Breadboarding, uh, basic coding, I'm guessing most of you all already know this. It's C, Python. One important thing is, uh, I would suggest if you are planning to get into hardware, is learn some kind of assembly language. Okay, so the whole point being, even if you're learning C today or writing the C program, if you don't understand like how a subroutine works, how branch instruction works, how against a branch LX instruction works, which changes states and stuff like that, right? That would give you more insight to become a good programmer. So the whole idea is that is why you would want to learn a basic ARM kind of programming level. And you get simulators on the internet for free. So you could try a code and stuff like that. Another thing that's slightly more involved is SkyCAD. Packard is another software for PCB design. It is GPL licensed, okay? So you're safe there, and it's well renowned in the market. So if you learn Packard, don't worry about it being shut down or sunsetted or whatever. And finally, for 3D design, unfortunately for major scale 3D design, there are not that many <coughs> softwares that are kind of open source. 
there's a software called OpenSCAD. So which if you're good at math, at, which I am not at. So if you're good at math, then you could use OpenSCAD to actually develop uh, software writing code which is close to maths. Okay? Because finally anything in 3D is finally a polygon. right? So if you can build out of that, you could learn using OpenSCAD. So that's why, unfortunately, my computer, though it runs Debian, I mean Ubuntu, I do have to have a Windows partition so that it could run Fusion 360 and a few other software just for 3D design. Okay, okay finding help. This is your starting point. Okay, so if you want to get started with hardware, this is the slide. If you want to take a picture, this would be the best slide to take a picture of. Is you start off with a product which is well documented. We've heard many stories about documentation already. So a good place to start is Adafruit.com. Okay, that has very good documentation. They have a nice learning guide. Okay, end to end for each of their boards as well as a bunch of other boards like BeagleBoard, Raspberry Pi, and stuff like that. Uh, there's an Element 14 community site. Uh, again, I put that a second because I used to write for them a long time ago. Uh, the next one is Hackster.io. Sparkfun is mainly instructables. Okay, so those are the sites you would kind of visit, kind of start with hard. Okay, so I have gone through most of the boards real quick. Now the big question in your mind must be, what do I buy? What is my budget? So if you are a student, what is your budget and what do you buy? So again, an answer to that is, it all depends on you, what you want to do. Okay, so currently I can probably say that I moved my mom to Linux. Okay, <laughs> people will say, how do you move your mom to Linux? It's just like that red color keyboard down there. Okay, so that is the Pi 400, which is running uh, Raspbian. Now they call it uh, Raspberry Pi OS. So this, you could basically, it has 4 GB RAM on it. You could actually use it as an end-to-end -end computer. And this is something that Mr. Kamath also pointed to, right? is you don't need to go and buy this fancy laptop or whatever. Obviously, it won't be portable because you have to lug around a monitor with you. But yes, that is the keyboard. Only thing you need is one mouse and a monitor to connect. Okay, the whole hardware of it, the whole Raspberry Pi sits underneath that board. Okay, so this, if you have around 8,000 to 10,000 rupees, that's the board to go for. Plus, yeah, and it's a keyboard size, right? And it has the GPIOs down there that you see. That means you could obviously try out all your circuitry, basically breadboarding and do all that kind of stuff as well. If you want to go lower than that, your budget is say 2,000 to 3,000, then try the Raspberry Pi 0W. Okay, there's a Wi-Fi version. They have multiple versions, 1.2, 1.1. Figure out which one is the latest one, and you can try that one. So that runs a full-fledged OS, but it will be slow. But say if you're doing a Linux project or something with respect to AGI and all that, you could buy one of those, okay, for a cheaper this. Once you get bored of it, you basically don't throw it away. You could still use it at home, but you could install this something called as a pie hole, which will stop all these ridiculous ads that come to you on your web browser and stuff like that. Okay, so you could just have it running with your, uh, what do you call that, Wi-Fi router or whatever router you have at home. You could use one of those. Slightly more expensive option is if you're doing something in C, then the top half of the slide is for you. Okay, C and then say circuit Python and stuff like that. If you want to do the OS stuff, it is the bottom half of the slide. Okay, so that's how I kind of made it. Uh, what I would recommend if you are at an engineering level or even doing something at Goa University, step up and try the legal form. Okay. Pies, I mean, if you look at it, even I've looked at uh, syllabuses from outside the country, most of the engineering as well as after 12th standard, they always try and use the beagle board. The syllabuses are created around the beagle board. Okay, so another story is, in, uh, I'm also doing a master's degree simultaneously, so we unfortunately are still using the PI. But again, having said that, we are trying to rally some of our faculty to change that to move it towards a beagle board. Okay, but I think that's slow. So I think that's all I had. Any questions? Hoping, and this was the main question I wanted to answer. I'm hoping this is kind of answered. What do you buy? So yeah, in terms of the feather, feather would go for about 800 to 900 rupees. The vegan one would be around the 8,000 mark. Okay. A good place to buy this stuff 
is not Amazon. And please don't buy hardware or electronic stuff like this stuff from Amazon. Okay, because I think the return policy thing that creates a problem wherein the hardware gets damaged or what have you. Okay, but the best place I have found is places like Roku.in. If you've heard of Roku.in, then that's a good place to buy. I think they're based out of Kerala or Tamil Nadu. Right? And these super labs, yeah. And you can buy it from element 14 dot in and stuff like that, but they have a shipping component to it, so yeah, so you work all that stuff. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs>